Hello, welcome to Bookworms. I'm your host, Alex. With me is my brother, Joe. Hello. And this is the show where we read a book and then get together and talk about that book. I gotta come up with a better like tagline for the show. Yeah, you kind of suck. We're, we're, we're off to an early start, aren't we? <laughs> so, Alex, what book did we read this month? Well, I feel like you already know the answer to that question. So we read A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. This was Alex's choice because he's the fool that likes these classics. It's a personal favorite of mine. It's one of the books that got me into reading back in high school. It took you that long to get into reading? Oh yeah, books are for nerds, dude. You know you know this. That's why I started in uh, middle school. You keep reading your Redwall books. Hey, those mice were awesome. Yeah, I was, I was only in it for the badgers. But we're not talking about Redwall right now. We're talking about A Clockwork Orange, which is not similar at all to Redwall. Or is it? So, a little bit about this book. It uh, was originally published in 1962. Anthony Burgess, he's a prolific writer throughout his life. This is most definitely his best-known work, due in no small part to a certain film that was made about 10 years after the book was published by uh, Stanley Kubrick, who made Clockwork Orange, and it became this this real cult classic, very graphic, very scandalous in its depictions of violence and assault. And it's, uh, it's even 50 years later, it's uh, still a very well-known film. Yeah, you know, we'll be referencing the movie occasionally throughout this podcast. They're, they're very similar to the movie and the book. There are diverges that we will get into later. The, the, the whole the reason why this book is so well known is because of the movie, which the author really did not like. Yeah, the movie is very shocking and it's very jarring to see. It's nothing quite like it. The book is... It takes it to a whole new level. Like They actually toned down the book for the movie to make it more suitable for... Any audience. Yeah, view, a viewing audience. This book is a satire, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with satire, the general theme is to go big or go home, because satire is meant to mock some sort of establishment by taking what they are their beliefs or their structures to extremes and so this is a society that allows for these horrible horrible acts of violence that we're going to be talking about in this story so strap your boots and get ready for some ultra violence so the versions that we read i believe we had the same introduction in our stories yep by the author we find out really quick uh anthony burgess is not a fan of this book He's really not a fan of the American version of this book because it cut a whole chapter out at the end, which he felt was the kind of coup de gras of the book. But the, his American editors and publishers felt that most Americans would not appreciate it and find it as a cop-out. Yeah, and anyone who's ever read a lot of Anthony Burgess, such as myself, or done any research on this author... He's a bit of a pompous windbag, or he was. He's, he's since he's passed away like 20 years ago, but he's very, he's always been very full of himself. Reading. He's an artiste. He's very artiste, which to his benefit, or his, it's very interesting to read his work because he was a very smart person, and his studying of language and character development. Like and all his works are is very interesting. Like even the way he he does dialogue, it, he did it in a very unique way. That each it gave each of his characters this sort and sort of unique perspective that was very them and made them a very real person. Whether it was giving them a stammer or some sort of vocal tick, he worked that in, and it made for it made for interesting reading. Yeah, and uh, Burgess, he's one of those kinds of authors that. Every sentence of every chapter in his books has some deeper meaning. It, it's There's no superfluous language or fluff in his stories at all. You know, this, and this book is no different. Pretty much, you pick a page, pick a paragraph, and you can write a uh, master's thesis on that. And yeah, I actually did that. I read this book for uh, college talking about writing styles and things like that. And then we had to choose a novel to read. So I went with the Clockwork Orange and I analyzed it. I'm actually using the same copy of the book that I used 
12 years ago for this class to do this. I was just fun, like, reviewing them all my old notes. I mean, like, Nerd. oh, wow, I was not smart. Nerd. Still not smart. Uh, so you mentioned that the American version and the Kubrickian version, as Anthony Burgess puts it, cuts out a whole chapter from a, the book. Uh, that is the 21st and final chapter of the book, where our main character has a sudden epiphany and commits himself to changing his ways. And in that 21st chapter, in the introduction, he talks about how, like, 21, he's in the numerology of this book, 21 is a symbol of when children fully become adults in almost every culture. That's when you achieve adulthood, is after you turn 21, you are a full-fledged adult, you're fully grown, you're making your way in the world. And by cutting that last chapter out, you lose that. So I'm going to put it in his words where he says, The 21st chapter gives the novel the quality of genuine fiction, an art founded on the principle that human beings change. There is, in fact, not much point in writing a novel unless you can show the possibility of moral transformation or an increase in wisdom, operating in your chief character or characters. Even trashy bestsellers show some people changing. When a fictional work fails to show change, when it merely indicates that human character is set, stony, unregenerable, then you are out of the field of the novel and into that of the fable or the allegory. The American or Kubrickian orange is a fable. The British or world one is a novel. And if you've ever seen the movie or you've read older editions of the book, you know that the main character, Alex, once he's gone through the government reprogramming and been reverted back he goes right back to how his original life was and that's the end of the story so without that final chapter he has no growth he's just he's a victim of a crime against humanity and he goes back to how he was and like you said pompous yes that was a very pompous paragraph in about 11 pages of very pompous paragraphs so let's hop into the story. Uh, where do we start off, Alex? Uh, I say we start off in part one, chapter one, on the first line. Pompous. <laughs> so the first line is a line that's repeated often throughout the story. It's the opening line to all three parts, and it's a frequently asked question of our main character. He asks it many times, and people ask it of him many times. And that question is, what's it going to be then, eh? And for a book that's all about choice and owning the decisions you make, that's a very important question. That's a question you ask your people ask themselves every single day. What what are you going to do? And what do they do? Well, in part one, they commit their lives to committing the acts of ultraviolence. Well, let's start with what they're doing to get ramped up. They're essentially just doing drugs. Then they go out and do that violence, which is basically just roaming the streets and doing hoodlum and hooligan things and beating people and having gang fights and finding women to abuse. Yeah, they start off, uh, they're in this bar, uh, the Karova Milk Bar, they call it. Uh, They're drinking milk with knives in it, I believe they call it, which is, you know, drugs, drug alcohol-laced beverages. And they're trying to figure out what they want to do, and they make the decision to go out and cause a ruckus. And it's important to note that these are all essentially teenagers. They're children. They're How old is Alex? Alex, at the start of the novel, is only 15, which we don't learn until he gets arrested at the end of part one. Yeah, but he's. And we, we do learn relatively quickly that he's the youngest one out of the group. Yeah, we learn that he's the youngest. It's hinted at that they're all very young because Alex like skips school and does a lot of very chaotic behavior and things that you might see in younger people. Poor decision-making and all that. Also, the slang that they use in this book, because he's the narrator, and he speaks in a made-up language almost. Well, yeah, it's, yeah, he speaks in a le- made-up language that... It's like a gang language. Yeah, and uh, we haven't even talked about the language. I mentioned that he's big into linguistics. We haven't mentioned... Yeah, Anthony Burgess developed his enti- this entirely new form of slang using particularly Russian terms and kind of mashing them all together or just made-up words. And he uses these throughout the book without 
hardly any translation or anything like that, and you have to work it out in context. Yeah, so, he calls it uh, NADSAT. Yeah, NADSAT, which is actually a slang term for teenager in the book. Yeah, yeah. and you can also, th- by the end of the book, find out that this language is constantly evolving, even within the story, where when Alex is getting older, the younger generation is changing their language, and he is having trouble keeping up with it. And I was uh, researching a little bit, like, why did Anthony Burgess choose to develop this NADSAP language for his characters? And it's because he wanted to use a lot of slang terms like teenagers do, but he didn't want the book to ever feel old because, like you said, slang terms change throughout history. Like, I work in a high school, I hear stuff I didn't hear 10 years ago coming out of these kids' mouths, and I have to, like, keep a little, like, living dictionary keep track of what they're saying i have two children and i have the same problem yeah that's cat bro i think that's already gonna be dead soon yeah so anyway it's a it makes for like a jarring like trying to figure out what's going on with this book like the first chapter it's kind of you might have to write it off a little bit having all these new words thrown at you and you're trying to work it out in context but it's so thick and heavy with those words that it can be hard to follow but just doesn't talk down to you He's like, he knows he can figure it out, so he just throws it out there and he says, deal with it. If you're smart enough to read this book, you're smart enough for me to talk to you. So the, the, the four boys, there's Alex, Georgie, Peter, and Dim. Dim being Dim. Yep. Uh, they're all very different characters, even though at first, Peter and Georgie, you might not be able to tell the difference. And Alex thinks you know, he's the leader of this group even though he's the the young one. But he's the one that's coming up with all the ultra-violent ideas as they come along and getting everyone excited to do whatever they're going to do. Yeah, we get the impression that Alex is a very streetwise young man, and he's got very little tolerance for stupidity, which is why he clashes with Dim a lot, but he fancies himself the leader of this group, and he kind of leads the charge in these uh, acts of violence that they commit throughout the first few chapters. And Georgie's kind of trying to wrestle that leadership and kind of taking Dim's side. And uh, is it Peter? Kind of is aloof and just following along. Doesn't really want to pick a side. Yeah, we don't learn a lot about Pete until the very end of the book. And he comes back in a big bad way. Yeah, let's, uh, let's walk through some of the things that they do in the first bit, though. So first thing they do is they see a guy carrying library books and they attack him. Kick him to the ground and just beat the snot out of him. They tear out his books. You know, he's got a lot of mathematical texts, famous literature. They rip it all up. They they beat him down and then they carry on. Yeah, and they and so they, they end up running into a another gang who's gang raping a 10-year-old, they claim. Yeah, and, led by Billy Boy. Yeah, Billy Boy. So they decide to clash with the gang and allow the, the girl to escape. And they have a big, essentially, street fight where one of the boys gets gutted pretty good. And then the cops show up and everyone takes off. After that, they steal a car. They go out into the countryside where they find a really nice house and they break into the house. Do the old in and out, in out with a woman of the house and beat up the man who's a writer who is writing a novel called A Clockwork Orange. And that's where we get the title of the show and a definition of what the title is supposed to mean. So paraphrasing the book, uh, Clockwork Orange is a something that has been stripped of all of its juiciness, all of its fruit, all of its reasons for living. It, like, the purpose of an orange is you know, to be this delicious piece of fruit taking out all the stuff on the inside and putting in clockwork mechanical things and it's running the running ways somebody wants it to it strips it of its purpose and it creates something new and something that's lifeless essentially so they they basically tear up that novel that manuscript and they trash a house do their nasties to the the, the people living there and Tying it back to the movie, this is probably the most famous scene from the movie when he's singing singing in the rain and getting ready to do terrible acts. 
unfortunately in the book that song is not referenced even though the whole time reading it it's just going off in my head uh and then they they take off everyone goes home and we discover something else about alex that's pretty interesting his love for music uh he does classical music and it might take a minute for people that aren't familiar with the big classics because he refers to the different composers by uh, by names, but not their full name as we would normally use them. Yeah, like he calls them J.S. Bach and Ludwig van. And that goes into showing that he has a, this appreciation for art, even if, or especially old art, and that kind of goes with his believing that he's more intelligent because he has this appreciation for classical music that other teenagers don't. And then that appreciation for music also brings on his violent tendencies, which is a big part of the book, uh, where when the music is playing, he fantasizes about his most vicious acts of violence that he can come up with. And that classical music is a good contrast to the acts of violence that they commit, because it's, I mean, Mozart and Beethoven made beautiful works, and his appreciation of that is in stark contrast to the terrible crimes that he commits. I made a note, because we're we're right around chapter 3 now, and I made a note that this reads like a thoroughly planned, yet hastily written book by a very talented author. It's clear he planned out a lot, but he also claims he wrote this book in three weeks, which I've tried writing books, and it usually takes three weeks, and a couple years but if you're a more prolific writer and a lot of these writers from this era did get to the point where good enough where they could write a manuscript that was of this quality within a few weeks if that's what just what all they did so we do meet after he goes to bed he listens to his music he wakes up the next day and he gets a vi- he decides to skip school and he gets a visit from his parole officer We also meet his parents, which are just completely overwhelmed by him and just pushovers. Yeah, they seem almost oblivious to how he is living his life. They don't seem oblivious, just they don't know how to respond to it, so their response is to ignore it. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I took out of it. Yeah, somewhere somewhere in there. They either don't know the extent or they're willfully ignoring it. And they're, they're scared of him, too, because he can have their his violent outbursts against them, and he feels like he's trained them. Yeah. And like, his parents, they seem to care for him. His parole officer, PR Deltoid, also seems to come around and encourage him to walk the straight and narrow to stay out of trouble, which Alex shrugs off or shows no interest in doing one of his teenage follies. Yeah, it's like a tough love type thing, but you know, when... If you can think back to when you were in school, it almost feels like that fake tough love, tough love that you know most kids just kind of like shrug off and like, yeah, okay, screw you, old man. And after he meets Pierre Deltoid, that's when he decides to skip school and he goes out and he does what I think is probably the worst thing that he does in this entire book, which is he picks up two ten-year-olds who are also skipping school and brings them back home. He gets them drunk and then he sexually assaults them. Yeah, and later on, I'm, we're probably going to talk about, like, does Alex deserve redemption? Does he deserve to come of age and live a free life? Because he rapes at least three people in this book. Who's to say what he didn't do before this book? Like, this story started. And he also beats a bunch of people. He kills someone. He kills two people in this book. It's it's a lot. He does a lot of horrid things. Is Should he be allowed to grow up and flourish as an adult and as you said this is a satire so it's you're taking something where do people actually change and taking that to an extreme of does this person you know deserve redemption for the acts they do but on steroids and reading it in satire it's even still it's it can be very hard to read and it can be very it's very shocking there's a lot of shock value in this book and this was this one was very shocking to me to read i did uh point out just kind of shifting topics a little bit the way he writes it he does this very frequently it's a common uh, writing style that you might see in famous books where there's an expectation 
where he sets up like you know something's gonna happen where like when he initially picks up those two girls like you know he's planning something nefarious because he we just read three chapters before where he's been doing horrible things and now he's getting ready to gearing up to do something and he takes him back he's getting him drunk he knows something's gonna happen and it's building and building and building and then there's what's called a distraction because right before it happens he is talking about the music that they're listening to and how it's building and how they're all jumping up and down and it almost becomes this beautiful language describing a piece of classical music and then he jumps on them he says if they would not go to school they must have their education and education they had had to show that he's you know that's the that's the full expectation distraction delivery and it also shows just this pure evilness with no guilt or culpability and then after that he you know basically goes back to sleep because he's all shagged out and when he wakes up he realizes he's late meeting his his gang and they've come to his apartment complex and you can tell there's a tension there because he you know the him hitting dim the night before over something uh them being saying something stupid and they maneuver him into breaking into this uh, older woman's house to steal from her and he gets in by himself and gets thwarted by a horde of cats but in the process she uh, he kills the woman just as the, the police are showing up yeah we they yeah, he did a great job setting it up earlier that the power dynamic is un, under duress and Georgie wants to be the leader of the group, and so they set Alex up, uh, where they break into an old lady's house. He accidentally kills her, and then we get that leads us into part two, where it jumps ahead two years. Alex is in prison for for uh, murder, and he has become the chaplain's, you know, uh, goody two shoe boy, uh, choir boy type thing, where he plays. The music, he's all excited because he gets to pick what music he plays for the, the, the prisoners as they're coming in and going out. He we, sings we see, very badly, all the hymns. Yeah, we see Alex is actually very good with adults that he wants to be good with because like, he's good with PR Deltoid until PR Deltoid rejects him at the end of part one, spits in his face. And yeah, we see him getting in with uh, the chaplain as well once he's in, into his prison sentence. Yeah, he thinks he can manipulate pretty much anyone he wants and he knows adults will get him what he wants so the ones he picks out he'll butter up as best he can he'll clean up his language to something more recognizable and with the chaplain he's had heard that there's this new thing to get out of prison soon and he hates being in prison because he feels like he's been uh, wrongly done and he's with all these disgusting people that have done wrong even though many of them have probably done way less than he's done. But he finds out that there's this treatment that will allow him to leave early and then he can get back on the streets and do what he does. Yeah, it's a new technique called the Ludovico technique. And initially he, he tries to get in and he's rejected. Like Chaplin talks the warden out of doing it, but then Alex kills someone while in prison and that gets him a front row pass to this new technique which Alex is super stoked about because all he can see is the reward for going through with it which is he gets out of jail doesn't have to do his full 14 years sentence he can be out that week and this is where the we learn that the, the chaplain is really big into free choice and if you don't have free choice are you really a you know a human anymore or are you just a clockwork orange again the theme that keeps coming up yeah alex willfully ignores the warnings from the chaplain he doesn't seem to understand that he's going to be stripped of his free will and the chaplain makes multiple speeches about the importance of free will and it all goes ignored by alex just wants to get out of jail so moving ahead quickly here he ends up going to this program on the other side of the prison he quickly finds out that yes it was a mistake as he's being put a, a drug into his system and being forced to watch videos of the ultra violence that he loves to commit but every time he watches it he gets physically sick and it gets to the point where uh, whenever he uh, sees or is confronted with any sort of violent tendencies he will become physically sick and 
basically can't defend himself and he has to grovel to try to de-escalate the situation. We also see that they play music while he is watching these videos, which happens to be classical music and many of his favorites. So now whenever he hears music, he will also become physically sick. The Ludovico technique is interesting because like, we don't really get a lot of the science behind it. However, it just seems to be almost simple condition stimulus. You see something or experience something, and there's some sort of reaction to it. And just with training, that becomes your reaction. Like we see that with dogs. You shake a food bag and they come running. Or you go into a movie theater. You smell the popcorn. You just have to buy that popcorn. Yeah. They essentially just give Alex PTSD in relation to any time there's an act of violence or assault or any sort of criminal activity going on. Yeah, and then he's deemed healed, sent back into the world with no support at all. And he goes back home to find out that he has been replaced with a man named Joe. And as I'm reading that, I had a giggle because this whole book is about Alex. And then Joe, the the not really related, but big brother version, you know, comes in and says, How dare you hurt your parents? And I just had a laugh because it, even though it has nothing to do with real life, you know, the whole Joe and Alex dynamic. Yeah, so Alex gets out of jail. He's... That part three starts when that happens. We get that question again. What's it going to be then, eh? What's he going to do now that he ha- doesn't have the free will to be able to do what he wants to do? He goes home, and he, his parents have rented out his room. And even he finds out pretty quick, even though he's been, quote-unquote, cured, he hasn't been redeemed for his actions. And he's not really cured. He, he still thinks he's gamed the system, even though a part of his brain is saying, idiot you're you're half the man you used to be you can't do these things but he thinks he can go back to his old life and just pick up where he left off and his parents try and word things nicely they explain they had to they had to sell off all of his old records and belongings so that they could feed the woman that he killed's cats which i don't know it's kind of funny to me but um then uh joe is comes in and he's this harsh voice of reality and he makes it clear that Alex isn't going to find any forgiveness, regardless of what he experienced. Yeah, and then Alex kind of goes on an odyssey of running into all the people he's wronged over the the year that we had read about in the beginning of the book. And having to confront all those people and find that, yeah, there is no forgiveness for him. And, he again, he never really learns that, you know... Yeah, these people are mad at me because I did them wrong. It's yeah, you know, how dare these people come at me, you know, when I've done nothing wrong. Yeah, he sees himself as cured and yet like the person who's attacked and ripped up his library books forms a mob to attack him. And then he runs in he runs into two police officers that I think is gonna save him. And it turns out that Dim and Billy Boy have grown up and become police officers. Because being an adult gang member isn't very feng shui, so they became police officers who are given authority and power, and they don't mind abusing that authority and power. And then he ends up out in the countryside, beat up and left for dead, and he crawls to the house of the in the country where he had beat up the author and his wife to discover that the, the woman ended up dying and that the author's basically gone crazy. In the in the movie, he's also handicapped, but not so in the in the book. Yeah, the uh, the author he's also very strong into um, holding government accountable, and he wants to use Alex as an example of someone who has been mistreated by this new technique, because he's very against the Ludovico te- he's very against the Ludovico technique. I'll be able to pronounce that correctly at some point, but. He doesn't know right away that Alex is the person who destroyed his life. But Alex keeps dropping hints accidentally once he realizes who the man is. And when Alex... It, I guess in, in the book, the, the old man never really does figure it out. In the movie, he does and starts torturing Alex. But in, in the It's in hinted the book, that he at least has an inkling of what's going on because but, Alex keeps dropping Nansat language and hinting that he knows more about the writer than he should yeah the 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 writer 
again, he, he's figuring it out, but his friends end up figuring it out first and pull Alex out of there because they realize they can use him towards their movement. And if the writer ends up snapping too quickly, they'd lose that chance. Yeah, they... Uh... Alex isn't out of the woods, though, because they uh, he finds out pretty quick they plan to make a martyr out of him. Which he obliges them and tries to commit suicide, but fails. But it does what they want, and it comes out yeah. that, you know, basically the program failed because you didn't really heal the person. You just incapacitated them and then threw them out in the world. Yeah. They, uh, yeah, so they lock him in a third-floor bedroom and then just blast classical music until he can't handle it anymore and he jumps out a window so then we get the uh deconditioning and putting alex back to normal you know people putting you know getting alex to sign away his rights to take uh, any sort of actions uh, legal actions against the government basically alex thinks he's outsmarting these adults and really, they're, they realize he's kind of stupid and just getting him to do whatever they need him to do to make themselves look good. Yeah. Press release. And in the American original American book and the movie, this is kind of where the book ends. Yeah, he's planning on going back to his old life. But he's, he sarcastically he's, says, I was cured all right. And that's how yeah. the movie ends. That's how the American original version of the book ends. And he thinks he's just going to get a new gang and cause his reign of terror again. Which is where it picks up in the seventh chapter. He's got a new gang going, and he's he's eighteen now. And chapter this chapter opens with that question: What's it going to be then, eh? And here's where we get some change. Yeah, he kind of starts getting bored with the violence. Uh, he realizes that the newest, youngest member wants to take over, and they're kind of battling it out. And he's seeing that. Is following the same patterns as his old gang. He ends up meeting up with Pete, who's married and started a real life, and is completely changed. And he's like, "Hey, that sounds like a good you know path for me too." And he yeah. kind of he realizes that he's bored with that life of destruction. He sees that Pete has built something for himself, and he wants to do that too. And he also starts thinking about his future. With uh, there was a theme in the. Th- a whole book where the older gang members want money and all of a sudden he realizes that he wants money. He sees Pete with his wife and he gets the idea, hey, maybe I can get a wife, then I can create my own progeny and be have that immortalness. You know, again, it's still all about him. He's still that narcissist, but he's starting to have more forward thinking. Yeah, and he says right at the end, he answers finally answers that question that keeps popping up. He says, that's what's going to be then, brothers. As I come to the like end of this tale, you have been everywhere with your little droog, Alex, suffering with him, and you have vidied some of the most Grasny Bratchney's old bog ever made, all on to your old droog, Alex. And all it was, was that I was young. But now, as I end this story, brothers, I am not young, not no longer, oh no. Alex, like, groweth up, oh yes. So that that's the book. I think we forgot to mention uh, what happened to Georgie. Georgie died. Yeah, so yeah, part two, we find out uh, early on in part two that Georgie had died. He wanted to be the leader, but he got in over his head. And maybe maybe Alex was right. On one of the few things. So, uh, let's get into the questions I come up with. These are questions I think up or steal off the internet for uh, food for thought while I'm reading, and then come up with thoughtful answers, and I come here and ask Alex these questions and force him to dance like a monkey and come up with a thoughtful answer on the spot you ready alex oh yeah go ahead so the first question is why is freedom of choice such an important concept in this book well that's what a clockwork orange is is that freedom of choice it's that thing that gives us life and makes us unique and if you take that away we become automatons and we are become slaves to our government we lose that ability to create and to make mistakes and to learn from our mistakes. So freedom of choice is what makes us human. It's because we get to choose every day what we are going to do with our lives. And we make millions of decisions throughout our lifetime. That If you take that away, then what are we really? So here's a question, Alex. If this book was written 
now or even say 30 years later where the words uh, robots and artificial intelligence were around do you think this book would have been framed differently because i mean when you when he describes a clockwork orange with all the uh, ticking um gears and all that stuff it kind of you know and the, the taking away of free will it does sound like very like robotic and again this book being in what year was it published 1962 yeah so that was kind of at the forefront of robotics so a lot of people just weren't really familiar with that sort of stuff so do you think again do you think this book would have been different if written 20 30 years later even or even nowadays they had the concept of robots and ai even back in the 60s i mean science fiction has been around by even by 1962 it had been around for a long time with hg wells and jules verne so there was knowledge of advancing technology and using that to create new things um, if it was written in yes if it was written in the 90s or early 2000s or even nowadays we would see more computer processing and maybe the ludovico technique involved more use of robotics or there was some sort of turn instead of calling calling it a clockwork orange it'd be a robot orange i mean i think a lot of the themes could still be the same free will is is and always has been free will however yeah there would there would have been more up-to-date technologies otherwise i don't think the novel would have changed that much would the violent nadsat speaking youth be different if they were put in modern times with video games and social media or would we still have the same kind of kids well they probably have you know more access to worldwide knowledge and they'd have they'd all have phones in their hands and they'd all uh, probably play video games i could i could probably see alex as like in like a modern age like being one of those people who thinks he's too smart or too good for video games so he shirks them off or eschews them while maybe Dim and Georgie just love them, love them, love them. So I kind of look at it as like maybe they'd be like considered incels. Because they're very antisocial, don't really respect anybody, and everything is the world against them. And I think if they had that social media landscape, they would have, you know, maybe they would, they would still be out in the world destroying things, but there would be a lot of in chat rooms railing against the world yeah i could see that being like a fun addition seeing the keyboard warriors being incorporated into the book that would be a that'd be a fun addition to see the contrast like alex who does these horrible things versus someone who's you know sitting on the couch typing out hate speech like that'd be like maybe like alex breaks in like reads it off his computer and then you know smashes it and kills the guy it'd be, it'd be an interesting thing to see or something like that's something like Dim would be doing in his off hours, and Alex would just look down his nose at is like, "What are you doing? That's crude." You know, you got to again go on. Alex being, we got to go back to the old ways of doing things. What does moral choice have to do with the concept of good and evil? Can you be good or evil if you have no choice? I guess is the kind of the question. Burgess puts it in his intro, no one can be completely good, just the same as nobody can be completely evil. Like I was saying earlier, we make hundreds of decisions each day. They're not all going to be good decisions. We are going to do things that are harmful to us, harmful to other people. So the concept of free will, it's going to hopefully just fall on the right side of things in the end. Uh, well, I kind of look at it as if there's no choice, things are just it just is therefore there, there's no morality anymore if, if you have no ability to say no to something or say yes to something you're just forced to do it and then then how can you say that that was an evil act i mean look at soviet russia where people are just they're told go do this and they had to go do it and i feel like like this book kind of has a lot of parallels with that kind of dystopian look on life that a lot of westerners had at that time yeah and we see that like the nansat language is derived heavily from the russian language so yeah there is that tie of communist soviet union they didn't have free will the way 1960s england did or america did are brainwashed people no longer people how are people being brainwashed in our day so again, it's it's that concept of 
free will and moral choice, if you're brainwashed, are you really human anymore? Like Alex, after his rehabilitation, does he have, you know, is he really able to function as a human being, or is he just an automaton that walks around semi-productively? I mean, if we're talking about brainwashing to the level at which Alex was brainwashed, again, this is satire, it goes big, I don't think we have that level of it in, you know, a modern society, but we still have less brainwashing and more maybe propaganda or manipulation people are very you know it kind of is a form of brainwashing though i mean you look at the over politicization of people these days and how they just get so entrenched into their side that that propaganda eventually does change kind of the way people are thinking and closes their mind down to other ways of thinking yeah so i was trying to get towards yeah there's a lot of influence, even if it's not, you know, the government prying your eyes open and forcing you to watch stuff. They still have that ability to, especially with the modern age, as you were talking about with the earlier questions, with having the phones out and keyboard warriors and incels. How do we keep our thoughts our own when there are constant bias and messages coming out at us every single day on what to think? What's 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 the right way to behave in a civilized society, and is it the right thing to do? Anytime you talk about dystopia like this, like these kind of questions will pop up because, especially with the people in that 1984 style nation, yeah, they were brainwashed to believe what the government wanted them to believe, and it's very similar to A Clockwork Orange with its satire. Like they wanted Alex to behave the way they wanted him to behave. And so they went about doing that. And so, yeah, there are, we do see that in the real world, not to the extent of either of those books. However, there are, uh, there's a reason those books got written, and it's because the authors saw this in their governments. Does language shape thought? And how does NADSAT parallel current language trends on the political landscape? I think it's interesting that Burgess created this NADSAT language to not have the slang appear dated, and by creating this new language, he made a bunch of terms that get used nowadays, which I find interesting. I don't know, I'm kind of digressing from your original question, but the um, way we use language is super important. Like, There's a, people whose entire careers it is is to learn how to reword things so it sounds either more drastic or less drastic it's like global warming for a while was being called climate change because it didn't sound as horrifying as you know global warming to sounds um there's examples all over the place like that i can't think of any right now because i'm it's getting late i'm tired but but yeah language is super important and it greatly impacts the way we think about things yeah i, I think it can uh, shape the way we think it definitely helps us process our thoughts it puts meaning behind our thoughts but we also have the ability to see critically think and see above that language when we are able to take a step back and look down on a problem look down on the situation that we're being bombarded with and I, I think that's like with the part with a, a political landscape i think that's the part where a lot of people are getting sucked in by this very uh violent rhetoric on, on either side and picking their sides and they're getting into the weeds and not taking that step back and critically looking at the situation from that thousand foot bird's eye view. Is there a connection between violence and music slash TV slash computer games? Why does Alex think that there's a connection between music and violence? Well, Alex is thinking on this. I can give the scientific answer that most people will no one quote in that there is no connection between violence and violent movies or video games or music and there's no way to really test that do violent people listen to violent music and movies or do people become violent from watching that stuff but the fact that so many people do do those things and then don't become violent kind of indicates that it is not a cause and effect and it works the other way too. Like some people say, like, violent video games or violent sports is an outlet for getting that rage out. 
and there's no context or indication that that's true either. So I, I don't believe there's any correlation between violence in media and real-world violence. Yeah, so, But why in the book does Alex think that then? Is it just because it mirrors his thoughts? Because that's the, the connections he's built in his head? Or is it he's just kind of a silly kid that's overly dramatic and can't separate the two? Yeah, Alex has what's called a, a hubris problem early in the book. <laughs> he, uh, he thinks his way of the world is the correct way, and Alex thinks he knows everything, and I think that's just part of his pushing his way of the world onto everyone else. Okay, and final question. We kind of already talked about this a little bit, but how do the NADSAT use the drugs compared to incels or overly politicized groups on either side of the spectrum? Well, I mean, the characters in this book, they're at that impressionable age where they're more likely to have extreme beliefs or fall for propaganda easier. And even in real life, we see that. That's why the army recruits at high schools. That's why a lot of the online places that you can go to get your political opinion of the day a lot of what they do, they try to keep it as modern and appealing to a younger audience as they can. That's why videos are 10 minutes, because that's how long a teenager can maintain att attention for on any topic. That's why the music that gets used is catchy. That's why the language that they use is very strongly worded. I think these kids are basically anti-social, the anti-social group. They, they despise all the people around them. It never really tells you, you know, that this is the, the main group of children. It kind of does, you know, hint that these guys are a very small subset of the, the children. They, they are doing a good job of destroying the city and civilization and putting a lot of fear into everybody. But they're just, you know, miserable, basically kids that want to bring everyone down to their level of misery. And I think that's kind of like, you know, what a lot of incels or other antisocial groups of people kind of want to do. They're just miserable. They want to make sure everyone else knows how miserable they are and don't want to see anyone happy and doing well. So, conclusions for the book. What do you got? So this book is a classic of dystopian literature. Against his best wishes, it's Anthony Burgess's most well-known book. It's... I think it's something I would be proud of to have written and something that you can really hang your hat on, even if people don't always entirely get the point of the book because they didn't see and they didn't get to read that final chapter. It's a very poignant study on the power of free will. Yeah, it's, it's shocking in its writing. It's shocking in the events that take place. However, the, in the end, it's a good reflection of the time and age and even though he wrote it and pounded it out in three weeks for money and nobody understands the point it's a very poignant reflection of what what it means to be alive and what it means to grow up and show us that humans have the capacity to change even if they do horrific things atrocious acts that alex does he's still in the end grows up and he wants to be a contributing member of society makes that decision on his own and does it better than the government could ever condition him to do well, I, I was kind of comparing this to my thoughts of when I first read it in my early 20s to now in my mid 30s and just the, the differences I took out of that story between the, the, the two reads you know, back when I first read it it was just this really awesome story of ultra violence and yeah it had its sick parts but it was like yeah this is a, a badass kid that's gonna you know, be fun to party with now reading it I, all I could see was a narcissistic psychopath that could never that would in real life probably would never really change and you know, even in the story what we see that a lot of his thought patterns didn't really change it maybe his motives changed but he just you know, he was still just that asshole that's all about himself and what he can do for himself. It's almost like a horrific version of Catcher in the Rye. Yeah, as a 
teenager, you read it, and you're like, wow, this kid's, you know, he's trying to fight against society, man. And then you read it as an adult, and, like, Holden Caulfield all of a sudden turns into this whiny little baby. And Alex in A Clockwork Orange is this little terror of a child, and that shock value that was blanketed under goes away and we just we see the person underneath yeah and it's definitely a fantastic story greatly written every sentence is perfectly created and molded and you can uh analyze it to the nth degree yeah that whole thing um i found like a whole thread just talking about alex's prison number like why why is his prison number like six six five three two one like there's this whole breakdown about how like it doesn't follow like a specific pattern, and that just that, that's like symbolic of who he is as a person. Yeah. Also, the uh, his prison number is a prime number. Oh boy. Yeah. So he's he's only uh, he's the only, only one like himself. Only divisible by one problem. A problem. Exactly. But yeah, it, you know the message of you know back when I first read of the idealistic prowess of youth. And the moral disgust of those that aged and capitulated to society, to something of, you know, maybe, you know, we, we do change. And, you know, maybe we are all a little bit more similar to Alex or Pete than we would like to, to, to believe. And what can we do to in our lives to, to change and grow and whatnot. And it's good to see, like, a lot of times dystopian novels don't end well for the main characters like i talked about 1984 earlier winston smith his life does not end so well or brave new world uh the main character ends up hanging himself at the end because he can't take it anymore so it's good to see a character even one as terrible as alex is have a chance to break out and be a unique person and finally uh for our thesis question is Alex a redeemable character, or is he forever lost in a constant evil? So we've kind of touched on this for the, uh, for how evil of acts Alex does and his inability to basically see his, the wrongs he's committing. When you're reading this, do you see that he could be forgiven for any of his transgressions? Or would you want to see him just burn in hell for the rest of eternity? commits a bunch of unforgivable acts in this book like it's it's kind of cut and dry like he's not a good person and really if he was he doesn't he gets away with it in the end he has to serve a two years out of a 14 year term he goes through and there's about a week of torture from the government and then he gets to skate free he goes back to his old life he does probably a bunch of stuff that's not mentioned at the end of the book and then he gets to ride off into adulthood and be a productive member of society and that might be part of the satire with the story because he does all these bad things but hey he's an adult now that was that happened when he was a kid he's a new person now all you know clean slate all is forgiven but it it's really not he's negatively impacted the lives of a dozen or more people just within the scope of this book you can't really say He's can't really say he's a redeemable person, even if what he did was when he was a child and didn't know better. He should have known better. There needs to be bigger consequences before we can start talking about that redemption. Yeah, and my first gut reaction was similar where Alex is never going to have a normal or outstanding ability of being a good human being. Nor does he deserve the deserve the forgiveness for his transgressions, the raping and murdering and just plain old beatings that he committed. But I kind of had a little bit of a change of mind when I was writing out my conclusion. While in real life, psychopaths are essentially unable to be rehabilitated or healed, uh, when they have uh, gone into the world that Alex is living, they can you know, really never go go back. You know, once you've gone down that. That mark and Alex is definitely a strong case for a psychopathic person. He's got all those trademarks that you would put in there. Uh, at the same time, most children have a lot of those similar traits too. You typically more at a, a younger age than what Alex is, but they they have a lot of inabilities to think of others other than themselves. They 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 are narcissistic. 
by nature. They, they, their, their brain functions need to develop more to be able to treat other people or things kindly. Uh, they're, they're self-centered. Uh, but they, they grow out of it. And while, the, as we said, this is a satire, the crimes Alex committed are heinous and unforgivable. But how often as a kid growing up did we do or say stuff that would be considered uh, horrendous now? Or you know, we look back and we're just horrified at what we did or what we thought or said. And you know, how often do, you know, especially in today's social media, do people's past get brought up and say, how could you do that terrible thing as a 15-year-old, say that terrible thing on the internet as a 15-year-old, but 20 years later, you know, they are a completely different person. They no longer feel that way, think that way. They don't even remember, you know, saying something like that. And if they do, they, you know, it's just, you know, again, a, a nightmare. Like, how could I have said that sort of thing? You know, there, there is a a growing up that, that people do. That, you know, if you're able to not commit the, the worst of the, the sins, you know, maybe you do, do deserve uh, some level of forgiveness, either from within yourself or other people when they see you later in life and see that you have grown up and do have some humility and regret for the way you acted as that child. Yeah, it's like the most of what teenagers do, you're probably going to end up forgiving. They'll forgive themselves, you'll forgive them, understanding that that's part of growing up. And the extent that Anthony Burgess takes it to in this novel, obviously, that's not something you're going to forgive. But, yeah. On on the whole, yeah, you're going to forgive a lot of poor decision-making by young adults. Okay, that is A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess. Moving on, though, what's our next one? What, so the, what, what's your next choice? So this gets to be my choice. Uh, we kind of mistimed it a little bit, but luckily uh, Alex's next choice still falls in line. You know, Coming into s- September, it's like a pre-October, so I decided to go with a horror novel, a thriller novel called The Winter People by Jennifer McMahon. It will be quite terrifying. Yeah, I haven't started it yet, but don't ruin it for me. You will pee your pants, Alex. It will be oh, so scary. You won't, you won't be able to sleep at night. But Especially because we'll still be recording this episode. <laughs> Again, you know, picked it because we're going into the, the fall, or when we finally put it out, we'll be Getting going into, into the spooky fall. Spooky season. Uh-huh. And... I thought it would be a good book. It's a book I you know, picked up on a whim. Never heard of the author. Never heard of the book. Just liked the, the title of the book because I'm a winter kind of person and it said winter people. So I was like, ooh, let's give it a try. And it worked out really well. It just definitely became one of my top books ever. You know, and I'm not really a big horror fan, but I hope you enjoy Alex. Oh, I will. And I hope you, dear listener, enjoy it as well. You can read it, or you don't have to. The choice is yours. Either way, we'll ruin it for you. <laughs> but that's for that's for next time. And until next time, I'm Alex. And I'm Joe. And this has been Bookworms. Make sure you like, subscribe, all that stuff. We have an email. Uh, KendallBookworms at gmail.com We have an Instagram at Kendall Bookworms. So follow us on that if you do that sort of thing. You know, we want to hear from you. Yeah, I got to remember to follow. All right, well, that's all for now. See you. Bye.